this time on Graveyard Cars, History in Reverse. Mike Hill and his son Michael are going on a 4,000 mile road trip in their 1970 Superbird. But first, Mark and the ghouls need to finish the job. Witness the complete restoration as they document, tear down, rebuild, paint, assemble, detail, and drive. And see the unprecedented reveal when the whole Hill family and the original owner see the completed Superbird for the first time. I spent quite a bit of time on the phone with Mike Hill talking about the Superbird. I had a pretty good impression of what I was going to be getting when it showed up. Somebody had stripped it early in its life, maybe back in the mid-70s, and that's what caused all the decay on the outer part of the, the body panels, like the quarters and the doors and the fenders, that kind of stuff. But looking around it and like looking underneath it, it looks like the structural part is not in bad shape. Like the inner frame rails, front frame rails, rockers, things like that, it looked like they survived good. These cars, to me, were my ultimate muscle car. Mike had wanted a Superbird from the time he was a little kid. Uh, there was an urban legend in town that a guy had one. Whenever I would pass by this gentleman's house, from the road, you could just see the tips of the wings as you were coming by. It was one of those things that where I said, if I ever get a chance, I was going to to go over there and see if I could buy these cars. Uh, however, the urban legend also said that the guy that owned the car was a lunatic who would stick his dog on you and kill you if you went up and so much as knocked on the door and asked about him. So Mike never did. We decided to build a Daytona clone. They got quite a ways on the Daytona. They got the rear body panel replaced on it from the 68 to the 69. They changed the side markers out. So we get our parts together on the tail end of the car. Well, when it comes to the front end of the car, I have no idea how to hang this fiberglass nose on it. So I discussed it with a guy that I met at the post office. He's an old gearhead buddy of mine. He said, you know what? He said, why don't you go around to the guy's house and show him that you're actually working on a wing car by taking your parts, and you might have a chance of getting a look at his car. And he did just that. He collected the few parts that he had questions about, got his son in the car, and they went over to the guy's house. Sure enough, he met me at the door. He comes out of the door and says, can I help you? I go around to the back of my truck, and I quickly grab the fiberglass nose cone, hold it up to show him, hey, I've, I've got parts here. He says, uh, what can I help you with? After Mike explained to him it was a father-son project that they were working on together, I think that softened the blow to the old man. And he says, yeah, if you want to take some pictures, go take some pictures. We get out of the truck. We start heading back to the woods. And as I look back in the woods, I see two Superbird wings just as plain as day. Here you got the year 2007. And these cars are still in this guy's backyard, undiscovered, unrestored just sitting there. I guess the guy that owned the cars really took a liking to Michael and to his dad and the idea that they were working on a project together. And uh, I think they began to form a friendship out of that. You know, when we went to the truck, I thanked him for his time. I reached across the dash and I got one of my business cards. And I also got a $10 bill that I had there in the ashtray and I handed him both of them. And I said, hey, I want you to keep this. And he said, well, what's, what's this for? I'm giving you that $10 so you don't throw away my business card because I know these are your children, and I know that they're, you know, they're yours and you want to keep them. But if for any reason you ever decide you want to sell them, I know that you know what you have here, and I know what you have here. Those cars are very rare, and they're worth a lot of money. I'll be willing to give you your price for them. And that's all I said. We didn't talk price. It was just, I'll give you your price for them. So after a few months, out of the blue, Mike gets a phone call from the guy that owns the cars saying, are you still interested in these things? I've considered selling you these cars under two reasons. Number one, you don't take these cars and resell them. He says, because my second condition is, you guys being a father-son team, he says, I want to see you end up with one bird, and I want to see him end up with one bird. Mike made the promise and kept the promise and ended up getting the cars from him. So it was a really good feeling to come away from all of that, not only with two Superbirds, but to know we've made a new friend here and that, that he's gonna see his kids come back to life. Today we're disassembling Mike Hill's 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Uh, the guys won't be here for about an hour, so that'll give me a chance to raise it up in the air, do all of my documentation without being interrupted by them and their foolishness. Uh, there's two things I'm looking for underneath there. One is Lynch Road assembly line procedures and unique procedures for just the Plymouth Superbird. And up here at the front on the K-member, you see an X. And that, that X right there lets somebody know something on the assembly line. Whether it was that the steering gear was in place or whether the, everything had been torqued or checked, that X meant something. Here's where all the big stuff is, big stuff. 
See the paint on the inside of that nose cone is running down. That means it was upside down when they painted it. And then here's the rivets. Those are great to know what the exact size of the rivet is. So once we get that nose cone piece off of there, we'll be able to uh, determine what the width and the diameter and the exact length of those are. And that would be the last two digits of the factory part number for the correct K-member for the 1970 Plymouth Superbird. What's happening, Chief? How you doing? You guys are on time. With the Superbird dutifully documented, the ghouls can disassemble it in preparation for the next stage of its restoration. I think the disassembly of the Superbird went just fine. For as rusted out as this thing is, I can't believe how fast we got the brake line and the gas tank out. And it's all intact. Well, so basically, we just finished taking the car apart. Uh, I still have to have the glass guys come out and remove the windshield and the back glass. Derek's got a few more things he has to take off of it, but I wanted to get it moved out of that area. We're on a roll. I work very closely with the body men as to what panels need to come off and how I want them taken off, how I want them replaced. And say, listen, this I need to have off. I need to dissect it this way. Just going to put this part of the panel back on, or we're just going to put this section in. What we're working on today is putting a brand new door skin on our 70 Superbird door shell. This is a brand new Auto Metal Direct door skin. This is a replica of the original door skin you would have got from Chrysler. Josh just gave us back the door uh, shell. It was media blasted down to the original bare metal. All the rust was removed. We have it treated on the inside and out. And so he starts it folding over, and then he, once he has it starting to lean, then he can get more aggressive. And he's gonna carry that on all the way around the door, full 360, till that skin is married to it like it's supposed to be in the right shape. Then he's gonna do his spot welds. At that point, that door will be united with a brand new door skin, an original shell, and we will have saved a good portion of that door. It's starting to look like a floor now, that big one piece. This, again, is the new Auto Metal Direct floor. It's a, a exact duplication of the factory one with all the factory provisions, including the drains, the hump for the shifter. When it comes to one of the single stage colors like our EW1 Alpine White on the Superbird, any of these colors that don't have metallics in them, you can panel paint them. That means that you don't have to have all the panels on the car and walk around it at one time and do the paint. You have to with a metallic because metallics fall differently. So in the case of the Superbird, that allows us whatever panels are done first, we can start painting them. Now the car is in the booth. I go in there and make sure that all the holes that are supposed to be there are there. All the ones that aren't supposed to be there aren't there. We got our squirter bottles and voltage regulator, all our normals. He doesn't know every hole that's supposed to be there. And back in the 70s when these cars were driven, people add a hole for a tack wire. They add one for an oil pressure wire. And so now's the time to fix it so that you're not going back and spotting in the paint. Get the correct bolt and put it in there. They actually get painted with the battery tray. But at right. least the fasteners, if you put those in, I would think, you'd be doing it pretty darn right. You got my blessing, buddy. Right on. See ya. Clients usually want the body and paint to look nice. Mike Hill, I talked to him about this. I said, you know that these were really edgy, not good from the factory. And he goes, I don't want that. I want it to be the nicest body and paint that you can do. I want it to look, in that one aspect, better than it did at the factory because the factory really missed the mark. They were mass-produced cars. But now we can improve on it. I think that we should. Today, the guys and I are getting ready to marry together the engine transmission, drive shaft, torsion bars, basically the drivetrain for the 70 Superbird. Reuniting the drivetrain in the Superbird, installing it is no different than if we were working on a Cooter or a Roadrunner or a Charger. Well, green light go, sir. Go right here. There's a lot to do in a complete restoration. We can't be experts at everything. That's why we have Larry come do headliners for us. Larry, he's been doing it forever, so he's really good at it. And even him, inside that car, can pull his hair out all day long trying to get a good, tight, drum-type fit on that uh, headliner.
Right now we're getting ready to put some pieces and parts on our Superbirds. My guess would be, and I don't have the exact answer, but I would imagine that Creative Industries is the one that applied the large Plymouth decal and the standing Roadrunner bird, because all these were unique to the Superbird. If they weren't, I think the manufacturer would have done it. I think over at Plymouth, they would have probably put them on, like the back deck lid stripe that goes on a 70 Roadrunner. That was normal on all the Roadrunners that were coated with it. Right now, I'm getting ready to do the most difficult part, which is the blackout that goes on the headlight doors and around the headlight doors uh, that's very unique to the Superbird. You know, on the Mopars, it was weird. Some of the stripes were painted on, some of them were decal. On the Superbird, they chose to use the decals on the nose cone. I think that's a way to save time and money. Right now we're getting ready to fire up the Superbird. That means we got to top off all the fluid levels, transmission, oil, uh, antifreeze. We're putting fuel in it. We just got a new uh, line of fuel here from Renegade. Gonna give it a try, it's 98 octane, so hopefully uh, the engine runs like it should back in 1970. Fire no fire. Let's just double check the firing order to be sure. I just like to be sure, because if it backfires like hell and you blow something out of it, all because you were too lazy to double check the firing order, that's the wrong reason. When Mark got it started, it sounded really nice. I couldn't even hear it. I was in the other room. I couldn't hear it when it started. You know, I've had a lot of people comment over the years on uh, my dance moves out there. Frankly, to be honest, it wouldn't surprise me if Dancing with the Stars got hold of me and asked me to be on there. People have realized by now that Mark's not right in the head. And when he starts this crazy dance, when he thinks something has went well, for some reason, his, his dancing ends up turning into boxing, and he usually wants to box me for some reason. I have no idea why he does that, except he's not right in the head. It bursts out of me like Tourette's. When it comes to putting on the label kits, there's a range of places that these decals can go, like the VIN label on the door. You could probably take a photograph of 20 different Superbirds, and it ranges up and down it probably by inches. I mean, maybe in some cases, six inches. If you put it on in an area that as long as it is within the parameter of where it should be, then there's no really, there's nobody that can say it's wrong. It's just your, your photo would show that it's not in the right place. You still have the human error, the human element when these decals are put on the cars. They were, we're not all put on exactly the same because if this guy put on a little bit crooked, this guy put on crooked this way. I use photos. I call guys like Tony D'Agostino and say, can you take a picture of your mission label underneath the hood so I can look at that? Um, to me, I think that the decals are the funnest part of the whole job. I mean, driving them and enjoying it and seeing all the waterworks from the owners when they come and they're balling all over the place and telling you you're the man is all fun. But to me, putting those last few decals on, the, the jacking instructions, the ethylene glycol warning label, the door vent, the emission decal, the stuff that goes up underneath the dash, hanging that little thing on the end of the turn signal, the, your starting instructions, or the sleeve that goes over the visor that tells you how to start it. All these things, I think, are the finishing touches, almost like that, that cherry on the top of the sundae that makes the whole entire package beautiful. Right now, we've got just a few more things left on it, not much at all. Like I say, uh, Derek has a little bit of paint touch-up to do under the hood. The main thing I want now is this car's completely drivable. It ran through the gears on the hoist. I'll just feel good if I can go around the block and back in it, make sure that everything's basically functioning, then we can wrap it up in the morning and wait for my kill to show up. Oh, I'm ready to see it. Yes, sir. Turn and hold it. I gotta be in the bathroom. Been a long time. Now, here it comes. Here it comes. Been a long Look time. Oh, wow. All right. yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Wow. That is fantastic. Wow. Nice job. Mark, Great job, man. Great job. <laughs> nice, buddy. Huh? That is fantastic. I told you that thing is gonna look beautiful. Nice. Yeah. Man, I'm gonna tell you what. Oh, amazing. Beautiful. Nice. That's beautiful, Mark. I'm gonna tell you. The whole wow. Oh, tickle good. Paint with hey, the way that's my... what we were hoping for. Mark, it is it is beyond my expectations. That's fantastic. It's, it's way beyond my expectations. Nice. 
Nice. Nice, that's good. Very good. Looking good, guys. That's great. Awesome. I really, really am glad that the car is so beautiful, and Mike loves it as much as I do. He's going to keep it forever, and his son will probably pass off to his children. And this, it just means a lot to me to know that the car will, will last forever, you know? And uh, the work that's been done on it uh, is just amazing what they've done. It's, uh, it was a total disaster when they brought it in here, and these guys made it look like brand new. And uh, I'm just really happy for them, really, really happy. Yeah, you got it. Oh, my. Mine, too. <laughs> Holy <laughs> I got to get a picture. I get one. To have the 2014 state figure champion of South Carolina set up on the on the spoiler, just like they used to in the old days. You know, when, when Mike put Jen up on the Superbird wing, it reminded me of pictures from the old days where a lot of people would actually take their girlfriends and put them up on the wing. It was just a neat thing. It was just neat to see that. Yeah, home sweet home. You look beautiful. Awesome. Nice. Mark, this is beautiful. I'm gonna tell you, Are buddy. Are you excited about driving it? I am I am more than excited. <laughs> I can tell by looking at you. You're oh, ready. yeah. Nice. Well, the keys are in the ignition, my friend. Go for a little drive and tell us what you think. Come on, guys. Bring the whole family, Harry included. Let's get in this puppy and go for a ride. All right, guys, you ready? Ready. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you can turn on the radio, you don't hear me yodel. <laughs> Boy, muffles sound good, don't it? Oh, yeah. Yes, they do. It is nice. Nice. Keep it in low gear so it sounds good. That's right. <laughs> what do you think, Michael? You like it? Yeah. You want one? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, she's running good. So nice. Run okay or not? Always scary. How'd it oh, do? Oh, it did great, man. It did great. Good. It really did. Fantastic. What do you think, pal? It's great. Excited? Yeah. It was truly a great moment here, and I'm not just saying that. To have Harry, the guy that bought the car brand new, show up and look the car over and give it his blessing. Well, I bought it back in late 1970. They were going for like $4,500, $4,600. I got it for $38. You couldn't get insurance on it, so nobody financed it. They cashed. So anyway, I got that, and I drove it back and forth from South Carolina to Texas when I was in the Air Force. Put a lot of miles on it, and I went to Vietnam and sat for a couple of years, came back. Started going to college. My girlfriend was like 200 miles away. Back then, gas was like 29 cents a gallon. Uh, I still wasn't making much money, but still, you know, drove it and I really enjoyed it. And then uh, probably around 76 or 7, I decided I was going to do stuff to it. Camshaft, intake, headers, and pretty much made the car undrivable. And that's when I pretty much parked it. I mean, I felt terrible the car looked so bad. I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people come up wanting to buy them, but people just bugged the heck out of it because everybody wanted to make a dollar off of it, you know? And so I just pushed it back in the woods. I knew about these cars since I was in high school. Uh, when I would drive by Harry's house, I could see the wings of these cars in the backyard or in his front yard. And as we came by, I always have loved these Superbirds. I finally uh, started working on a clone because I never thought I could be able to afford one. A friend, my old drag racing buddy of mine I hadn't seen for years told Mike you know, to come over and mention his name, so Mike did. And Mike was just a nice guy right off the bat. You know, he wasn't acting like everybody else. My son and I took our parts around to Harry's house and showed him that we were working on a wing car. He says, hey, you know what? He says, come back and take a picture of the ones I've got. You can find out how your parts go on. My son and Harry struck off a good conversation. Uh, my son is very respectful, good straight A student. He and Harry hit it off real well. They started talking about motocross riding. It was really good to see him and his son together. They, they had a great relationship. And I really didn't have a good relationship with my father when I was coming up. And uh, it just did something to me, you know, seeing him like that. Mike told me he would never sell them. He would always, you know, cherish them and drive them. And he would take better care of them than I did. When it was in the backyard, it was really, really rusty and falling apart. And, and I felt real bad about the condition I let the car fall down into. And seeing it like this, I'm just amazed at what they've done to it. You know, it's just, it's like it's a brand new car. Like they, the rusty car never existed and here it's brand new and they just rolled it off the showroom floor and they're tricking me or something. I don't know. But it's just amazing.
I am 100% happy with the way Mark and his team handled this car. It is beyond what I expected. I never thought the car would turn out this well. I was almost afraid to drive it for what we've got here, but it's just so nice. But you know, I bought it and brought it to Mark to make a driver out of it. And we're getting her to take it 3,000 miles as soon as we leave here. Yeah. Right. You ready to take that first leg, buddy? Huh? <laughs> So did it do good? Mark, did it, good? it did great. I am, I am ecstatic about that. It drove perfect. I love it. I, I can't wait. My, my hat's off to you. The whole team well, and this car coming together the way it has. Yeah, yeah. they really did it. made us happy. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Darren, thank you, uh, thank you, buddy. Make it too obvious. Yeah, thank you, man. First off, there is no perfect car when they're restored. I think the Superbird turned out very good. Did it turn out perfect? No. Were there flaws and imperfections? Yes. But overall, consider what that car came in here like. It turned out very, very, very good. Michael, you ready to hit the road? Yes, sir. We got seven to 10 days to get home. I'm gonna let you take the first leg. All right. You know. Here, I'll see you uh, in seven to 10 days. I love you. You be careful, All right, Harry. Harry. Yeah, man. You were the official, you were the official escort from my wife home, okay? <laughs> All right. Good luck. Good to see you. All right, All right buddy. Later. Yes, sir. Y'all have, have a good flight. See you later. Clean it out. Nice. Hey, nice. Hey. Thank you, Mark. You made a good car. Car's running really well. There you go. So where do you want to hit first? Well, I figure if we head down the California coast, we're going to end the Oregon coastline. We're going to hit California. We're going to run the coastline down uh, right along the beach. Try to take in as many sites there. Maybe we can hate. Hey, you know, I've, I heard they do some sand dune riding out there. Yeah, that'd be and, fun. And you know, I know how you like to ride motocross. Uh -huh. What you think about doing that? Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be nice. Cool. To know that their journey with the car back home begins now, and knowing that it won't end there, that this is now going to be part of their lives for the rest of their lives and generations to come, pretty much solidifies when I say that I am the dream maker, that I am the Sandman. You know, don't say, Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Say, Mr. Warman, bring me a dream. If you need me to duck down, if you see any really pretty girls and you need me to duck down. Oh, uh, at least we got room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your tongue, boy. <laughs> I am 100% happy where I'm at. So Mike and Michael, I think it was uh, 10 days and 14 hours on the road, almost 4,000 miles. They drove that Superbird from Springfield, Oregon, all the way home to Sumner, South Carolina. It's always nice to reveal the car to the owner. The Superbird, there was a big buildup on this because they're actually going to drive the car back home, which put a lot of extra pressure on us. Yes, I was very happy when the car was revealed. I was very worried for the return drive home. Truly for me, and I think for anybody who's ever restored one of these cars or done a, a customer's car in general, the most rewarding thing in the world is to find out their home <laughs> in one piece. I mean, they stopped in the Redwoods down in California. This is beautiful stuff. They went to the Santa Monica Pier. They, uh, they stopped at every tourist site, Grand Canyon, all the way back home. That's a trip of a lifetime between Mike and Mike, you know, dad, dad and son. It's something that probably never repeated in their lifetime. It's something that we, the rest of us are going to dream about.